broad terms, we can understand the rise of the secession movement as the collapse of the middle ground. The middle ground had to be destroyed. The idea of secession, it would appear, would be crazy in, say, the early 1850s. I think in some sense they lost their faculty of reason. There's a part of this story that I just find so interesting because we're going all the way back to 1860, but you see the role of the media. My guest today is Paul Starobin. He is a frequent contributor to The Atlantic and The New Republic and was Moscow bureau chief for Business Week. And his writing has appeared in The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. He is the author of Madness Rules the Hour, Charleston, 1860, and the Mania for War, from Public Affairs Press. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Bruce. Great to be here. Charleston, South Carolina, the subject of your book, was and is a beautiful city, pleasant harbor, palmetto trees, old churches and buildings. But lurking behind this was a nervous, militant city with much racial tension and tension between blue-collar and gentry folk in the city. Perhaps you could describe that. Charleston, in many ways, was the heart of what we now call the Old South. Slavery in Charleston as an institution, as a way of life, went back hundreds of years, even before the year that we're talking about in the book, 1860. It was there from the beginning with the founding of the colony, the settlement there by the British. And so it really uh, became woven into the fabric of, of the city's life. And you had a kind of gentry that was dependent uh, commercially and, and, and culturally as well on this way of life. And so as Charleston grew, and at one time, you know, it was one of the most prominent cities in, in, in America, and even before there was in America, you know, New York, Boston, Charleston. Charleston was a leading port, so in some ways it was also very kind of cosmopolitan. Uh, things began to change somewhat. Uh, around the turn of the 19th century, the end of the uh, of, of the 17th century, let's say, when Charleston began to diminish somewhat in commercial significance compared to places like Baltimore, New York, and Boston, mm -hmm. uh, it began to see a wave of immigration, uh, white men and women and children coming from places like Germany and uh, Ireland. And they were not able to afford slaves for the most part. They were looking for just blue-collar, you know, manual work, however they could get by. And the gentry wasn't particularly interested in, in those people uh, either. And so you did have this kind of complex set of tensions between the different communities. You also had layered into this the, uh, the so-called free blacks. These were black uh, men and women who had won their freedom, who had been given their freedom, by their masters, and they were kind of a buffer class uh, in, in Charleston, and some of them owned slaves themselves. So you had a very kind of complex uh, urban environment and a lot of stresses and strains. Let me ask you on the question of free blacks in Charleston. Do you have any kind of rough estimate there? Was it thousands of people? A couple of thousand. I believe it was about, I mean, if we're talking in the year 1860, Charleston was about 40,000 people bit over 50% of them were white, a couple of uh, thousand of free blacks, and the rest were slaves. So it's a good, good percentage of the uh, population there. Charleston was probably about 60% white and 40% black, including the, uh, the free blacks. You also had significant numbers of, uh, you know, mulatto, of mixed race uh, population in Charleston. And the free blacks, the so-called free blacks, in many ways, they really were not free blacks were not allowed to have their own dogs or pistols. I mean, sometimes they, you know, they had privileges like at, at church and marrying who, who they wanted. So if they could own property, that was important. You know, they were tailors, they could keep uh, money at the bank and so forth. So there were all sorts of privileges that were available to them, not, uh, of course, available to the slaves, but the privileges could easily be 
you know, revoked by the gentry and often were in, in times of tension. And, and that's something that happened in 1860 as well. It seemed like the, the tension towards blacks in Charleston came more from the blue collar, the laborers and their leader and the mayors that would kind of curry favor to them than the gentry. Well, the gentry was more or less satisfied with the state of affairs in, in Charleston, the status quo, because it had profited from it. And, you know, we're talking about gentry that would, uh, you know, just about as soon put a you know pistol to their head as, as hold a hammer in their hand. I mean, <laughs> they were not of the blue-collar sort, uh, and very class-conscious. So they much they looked down upon these, these sort of roughneck, uh, you know, blue-collar sorts, the Irish, the uneducated, uh, types coming over on the the boat, you know, m- much as as you know the gentry and in, in the Brahmins in Boston did, you know, more or less around the same time, right? In the 1830s and 40s and 50s, these waves of immigration were coming through, uh, and just as today, I mean, there were a lot of efforts to restrict uh, this immigration. In Charleston, the gentry joined in those efforts. The blue collar workers felt that the uh, the slaves. And slaves for hire, I mean, Charleston had this kind of unique system uh, whereby a slave, uh, a master of a slave could essentially rent his, you know, quote unquote, property for odd jobs around town and frequently did this. And the slaves, you know, sometimes were canny enough to pocket some of the income. All of that was very much resented by these, you know, white, blue collar workers. I mean, Charleston was beginning to industrialize. You know, there were factories, there were sawmills, all this sort of stuff. So there was a competition uh, for labor there. And as far as the the white laborer was concerned, those were his jobs. Why should the slave be able to get any kind of income, you know, at the sort of job, even if it was digging a ditch? I think that's interesting in your book, because the last thing that probably most people get in a kind of common textbook history and a brush through events very fast would think would be that uh, the Civil War possibly was started with instigation from the laboring classes. You know, it's always thought of as, this is a this is a group of plantation men who decided that they wanted to secede. Yes, but I think we have to be careful about that mm-hmm. because it, it is complicated. I think, the pro, I think that the planter class uh, had it, and it's very much, a, you know, the heart of its self-interest, slavery and the slave system. I mean, they believe, the planters in Charleston really truly believe that they couldn't grow cotton, you know, profitably without slaves. They didn't think uh, they could do it under a sort of a, a, a wage system. So they um, very much nourished, you know, the sort of and, and, and distributed and, and wrote the, the propaganda about slavery and about the need to protect the slave system that everyone in the white community, you know, digested. So I don't think, you know, we don't want to sort of cut the planners off from from that part of the discussion. Uh, but I think it, you know, it worked in the sense that the laborers b- believed that they were part of a superior master race, and so uh, even though, you know, ar- arguably, you know, secession, uh, the breaking away from the union was not in their interest, they came to sort of accept it as sort of part of their southern pride or heritage, or you know, the nationalistic uh, sentiment that was circulating in the South. Talk about the mayor. And the vigilance committees and the and how militant Charleston was. So in the timeline here, and I think it's important to see this, the South and Charleston would go through sort of waves or spasms of concerns about slave insurrections. In Charleston, this was particularly true. They had a major slave rebellion, or at least the threat of a rebellion, back in 1822 when a free black Denmark Vesey threatened uh, a revolt. Uh, if we go to the end of 1859, October 1859, we have John Brown's raid on Harpers Ferry, Virginia, which was intended to ignite the Civil War. It sent a wave of fear through the South, including in Charleston, and the so-called vigilance committees cropped up in the city of Charleston and in planter communities around Charleston. Basically, they were charged for looking, you know, looking at, you know, the enemy within. It almost uh, conjures up the, the Salem search for, for witches, the serpents among us, which is language that I'm taking from their, their charters. These are essentially, you know, citizen Groups apart from official law enforcement, you know, on the on the search, on the prowl for anyone who might be suspicious, you know, an abolitionist, uh, anyone seeking to kind of, you know, get that John Brown kind of message uh, circulating in, in you know in the veins of the of the body politic. 
banning literature. It was uh, nearly impossible to get a copy of the New York uh, Tribune, Horace Greenlee's abolitionist paper in, in Charleston. Books, many of the slaves and of course the free, free blacks could read. They didn't want literature in their hands. You talk about how they would look at people like uh, workers that might come from the North, teachers, nurses yes. that would come from the North, and uh, even soldiers. A soldier has trouble booking a hotel room at night. A woman who is from the North but kept quiet about her views for the most part is hauled in front of the mayor and then locked up in prison. Yes, the seamstress, uh, Catherine Botsford. I mean, that was a very interesting uh Story and I, I think telling because uh, Charleston, um, of, of course, would not be welcoming to abolitionists. But before these stresses and strains, you know, really intensified in 1860, the likely scenario is that if somebody like that is is found to be in the city, they would just be put on a train and sent out of town. In the case of this seamstress, uh, uh, who who you know openly con confessed to having abolitionist sentiments she was uh, put in a you know in the jail in Charleston uh she was given an amount of bail that was impossible for her to meet there was very little sympathy she met with the mayor he encouraged her to write to the mayor of New York to see what he might advise her well the mayor of New York uh, actually was a, a southern sympathizer so he had basically you know, New York got a, this is a digression. Got a lot of money from the cotton trade, and basically there was an important element in New York City that essentially supported the South, or at least you know the cotton South and, and slavery and so forth. So she got no sympathy. Eventually, they let her out of jail because you know there was nothing else to be done with her. So there was a meanness of spirit that developed in Charleston as the year went on. The idea of secession, it would appear, would be crazy in say the early 1850s. And there was, and you describe in your book, a failure of the moderates who really did have control of South Carolina, for the most part, the Oars, Memminger, if I have that right, and the failure of them to pursue a moderate solution and get any help um, on the net from, from national players or other states with that seems to have been one of the things that that led to the secession movement's rise. Yeah, I think in broad terms, we can understand the rise of the secession movement as the collapse of the middle ground, as it's so often the case in politics. Um, in Charleston, you had uh, some very canny, you know, opportunists on the radical side, the secession now side, we can, we can say, who understood, sort of like Bolsheviks of a different era, that the middle ground had to be destroyed. I mean, literally, you know, destroyed. Uh, there could be no middle ground because that, you know, we needed to polarize the situation. But there was a very prominent moderate in, in Charleston who um, I talked about at length in the book, Christopher Meminger, a fascinating figure, an orphan uh, off the boat from Germany, uh, tremendously precocious. Uh, his his mentors could see that right away. Most of the orphans in the house in Charleston went on to the trades and so forth. Not Christopher Memminger. At you know, at a very young age, just in his early mm -hmm. teens, he was sent, shipped off to college at, uh, in South Carolina, uh, at University of South Carolina in Columbia. And so he kind of rose as part of the uh, Charleston elite. Became a lawyer. Uh, and essentially moderate in temperament, you know, member of the legislature. He wanted, his great fear was that Charleston and South Carolina would go it alone, you know, would secede from the South, leave the Union, uh, but not in concert with other Southern states, and thereby expose itself to great risk. And it was a very reasonable fear, as I think almost anyone could acknowledge. But his effort to seek that moderate ground, in particular, a trip he made to um, Richmond, Virginia, in the beginning of 1860 in, in January with his daughter, an effort there to say to Virginia, which was kind of holding out on, on secession, look, you know, let's have a conference, let's get together, let's talk about our alternatives, let's see what we can do. Well, you know, Virginia was not really at that point, even when they wanted to meet with the other southern states to have that discussion. So uh, the moderates, uh, men like Matt Madrid, there was nowhere else to go, really. I mean, it was a failure. Uh, he went back to Charleston, and the rest of the year increasingly became season for the radicals. I love that division that you make, and I think it's important for people to understand um, 
how the Civil War progressed and how the secession movement progressed, that really a lot of the debate wasn't just between union and secession. It was also between secession, South Carolina alone, and secession with cooperation with other southern states. And it gives a a picture of different ways that the Civil War could have turned out. It didn't have to just be the way that it did. If perhaps there was cooperation and a nicer secession movement, if you will. And it's also interesting, um, Memminger's play for Virginia, just you have this interesting political dynamic. Virginia was too moderate to jump to a secession convention, therefore alienating this moderate from South Carolina who then couldn't calm down his radicals. Right. And then you end up with war. Yeah. I mean, uh, it really ended up playing out much as the radicals wanted, which I don't think, you know, we can attribute some of that to to calculation on their part, but we can also say it was just, you know, from their standpoint, uh, you know, good luck. But just to emphasize that moderate element, I mean, we're talking about uh, Jefferson Davis, a senator from Mississippi, right? I mean, he was the radical yep. from Charleston wrote to him, you know, as the year progressed in 1860, said, well, what about Mississippi? You're ready to go, right? And Jefferson Davis wrote back, and this is the future president of the Confederacy, right? Nope, nope, actually, we're not quite ready. We're worried about our ports here on the Mississippi, uh, you know, all kinds of practical concerns should war come. So, uh, you know, maybe Georgia, Alabama, but there wasn't a whole lot of support for immediate secession in anywhere except in South Carolina. And so they ended up of course, going alone, you know, by themselves in December of 1860, they took an enormous risk. I mean, they didn't know, they couldn't have known that, you know, whether others would follow. That's right. A lot of people think of the Civil War as the, the, the war between the states and their sense of the history is that, oh, this group of states combined, but really it was South Carolina leading the charge. Um, a reminder that I'm speaking with Paul Starobin, who is the author of Madness Rules the Hour, Charleston, 1860, and the Mania for War from Public Affairs Press. I recommend it if you want a good sense of how the Civil War started in this crucial city of Charleston. Because of my podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, is about you know, relating history to the politics of today. There's a part of this story that I just find so interesting because we're going all the way back to 1860, but you see the role of the media, and particularly one media, the Charleston Mercury, and owned by the Rett family. This media power seems to have stirred up um, the madness. Could you describe a bit about the Mercury, and then also perhaps address a, a question that that I have reading the book is is was it the media that really stirred this population up, as is we see so much of that today, various media forms kind of getting people agitated about politics where they might not have been, or were they already in that state in Charleston? Right. Well, I think it's an interactive uh, dynamic, as it often. Is I mean, the media, in this case, the Charleston Mercury, uh, we're talking about a daily newspaper. And remember, this is the era of print, right? We're not talking about mm-hmm. the Internet or even radio or television or any of those things. This is the way people are getting their information. It's newspapers, it's pamphlets, it's magazines, and most of all, newspapers. And not everyone could read. So we had a fairly, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's a literate population in Charleston fed by the Mercury, and there, were, there was another paper as well. And the Charleston Mercury circulated uh, outward. I mean, it circulated as far as London. It was in New Orleans. It was in hotel lobbies in New York. Abraham Lincoln, uh, his law office, uh, Lincoln and Herdman, they had a subscription in Springfield, Illinois. The Mercury uh, in 1860 uh, was the vessel of the Rett family, as you say. And that's Barnwell Rett Sr. and his son, Barney. Barney was Rhett Jr. Uh, Barney had not really proved himself yet. Uh, Rhett Sr. was an older statesman-like type, uh, been through the Senate, the House, uh, deeply radical uh, in, in sentiment, viscerally, so Southern nationalist. Barney, in many ways, took after him, and the Mercury was their vessel for implanting on a daily basis that kind of message. Uh, Harper's Ferry, right, October 1859, the lesson of the episode, the Mercury says, is the South needs... 
you know, to stand on its own. We need to be independent. We need to, you know, get rid of the North. It wasn't a message that everybody in Charleston uh, was always paying attention to. I think that the crucial aspect of the media here is that events can seem to confirm these, you know, this, these sorts of attitudes and opinions. I mean, Harper's Ferry was a real event. I mean, John Brown really did want to ignite the Civil War. That was grist for the Mercury. Uh, at the same time, the Mercury, Charleston, they were being baited by media in the North, like Horace Greenlee's uh, Tribune. They were being mocked, you know, for all talk, no action on secession. So the Mercury made, you know, great grist out of that. I mean, the genius of the Mercury, and I suppose of any uh, propaganda, is it can, it can sort of take, it's not all fake news, it can mm-hmm. take these little bits, these facts and so forth, and weave them into a compelling narrative. It's really about the narrative, right? I mean, people, uh, we have stories that we need uh, to believe, we need them to understand, to make sense of what is happening uh, around us, especially when there's confusion, there's chaos, it's not really clear what is happening. Well, the Mercury thinks it knows exactly what is happening and what needs to be done. So when you get a political environment like that, uh, it can very much favor these kinds of uh, radical voices that, that uh, advance you know, what might be seen as a fairly simple-minded you know, uh, uh, a, a agenda, but, but you know, it, it, it finds its adherence. That, that's a really interesting point is it, with today's cable networks and, and social media and that idea of like a nugget, little nugget of truth, um, something like in their, in their case, it might have been, ooh, watch out for your, uh, watch out for your tutor. They could be a secret abolitionist, yeah. or there's right. going to be a slave revolt tomorrow, or mm-hmm. what happened to John Brown. And I, and I think it is important to see from their point of view what John Brown's raid, you know, just an attack on an arsenal that really was an attempt to start a larger revolt, which would have had a lot of farms on fire and, yeah. and people dead in Virginia, and what the impact of that was on the Southern psyche, so that uh, I get what you I get when you say that it's partly the Mercury playing on the fears, and then partially the fears there. Yeah, the fears are there because you know John Brown had a history. I mean, there was you know bloody Kansas, you know the war there, uh, the sort of mini war, set of skirmishes which were bloody, you know, fought over whether you know Kansas would be a slave state or not. I mean, there was a lot of history there. So the Southerners were not wrong. To fear uh, the abolitionists, um, not wrong uh, at all. I mean, the, the question, you know, was sort of how to address uh, the abolition movement, and the Mercury um, believed that compromise was simply not possible. And so the message to the uh, citizens of Charleston and everyone else was, um, you know, go to the barricades. You know, we need to defend our rights at all costs, come what may. If you find that you can't wait for the next episode of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, don't wait. Subscribe to the premium podcast. It can be as little as $2 a month. And what you're going to get is previous episodes that we've aired over the 11-year history of this podcast. Plus, you'll get bonus episodes. In the last uh, cast about emoluments, we talked a bit about George Washington, Mount Vernon, his farm, his operations. Well, in the bonus episode on the Premium Podcast, we get into the importance of the Potomac River to the new nation and what Washington was thinking in locating the capital there. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com We also look at 1789. Yes, President Washington's first year and how that went subscribe now it can be as little as two dollars a month more if you want to support the program more and get more features www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com let's talk about the democratic national convention 
uh, of 1860. The Democrats, <laughs> in their in their wisdom or what they thought perhaps in their convention in Cincinnati, decide, hey, the next convention is going to be in Charleston because we're really going to impress those Southerners that right. we're a great national party. And they have the convention right at eight, in 1860 in Charleston in the in the heat of the secession talk and all of the turmoil and i think the story that's traditionally told is is very common you know, stephen douglas northern democrat goes down there and wants his coronation and doesn't get it and and the delegates leave and it's all broken up and it always is told in history that it's kind of a spontaneous event like that your book perhaps suggests a, a different tale that there were definitely some people in Charleston who very much wanted the Democratic Party broken up as a national party and for that convention not to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think we can see that in the, in the sort of the letters uh, that were written at the time. I mean, uh, the radicals in Charleston, uh, let's, let's talk about Rhett Jr., the editor of the Mercury, the son of Rhett Sr., uh, very much had it in his mind that this convention was an opportunity to break up the party and therefore uh, ensure the victory of a Republican, you know, by definition, anti-slavery president, and, you know, bring on the confrontation uh, that he desired. So he, as early as um, J- January of, um, of 1860, he was, he was, you know, fanning this uh, idea of how, he was writing to his uh, the Charleston uh, <coughs> congressman William Porter's Miles. Here we have it, January 29th, 1860. That uh, you know we need to pursue this strategy of of uh, of using the Charleston Convention uh, as an opportunity uh, to resist uh, to deal a blow to the so-called National Democrats. Those would be the the Douglas Democrats and men like Orr you mentioned in South Carolina. Uh, you know, bringing the, the so-called states' rights men, as they were called, uh, in control, uh, and essentially giving them their marching orders, that they were to resist at all costs, uh, you know, a party plank, which Douglas was advancing, uh, basically to allow for some form of his, you know, popular sovereignty in the, uh, in the territories, you know, places like Kansas and Nebraska, that was the great issue. So the Southern uh, radicals uh, were determined to resist any movement of a party platform in the direction of um, possibly allowing for slavery to be banned in the territories. They said that was simply unacceptable. That was the uh, that was the line that they drew. And so essentially, when the convention in, went in that direction, and the Douglas men refused to buckle on that point, you know, not wanting to lose the Northern vote, uh, the convention uh, broke up. So there was that spontaneous element. I mean, it was that kind of situation, the hot situation in Charleston, where, you know, the delegates were, were angered, you know, the southern delegates, by the refusal of the Douglas men to move. But, but it had been very much anticipated by people like Rhett Jr. and certainly leaders of the revolt, people like uh, Gansey of, of Alabama, uh, were on board the strategy as well. So, yeah, it was sort of like, you know, the worse it gets for the party uh, in the eyes of the radicals, the better it gets for us. There was a lot of calculation that was attached to that in, in Charleston. You know, uh, the Civil War becomes so important for, for it, it always is important in the American mind. You know, it happened in the 1860s, but we still talk about it today. I was riding with an Uber driver the other day who he told me his his father, you know, he was from Alabama, and his father would, you know, just didn't like the North because of the Civil War. And I was thinking, well, I mean, I know your age. Your father certainly didn't fight in it. My family came from there. A bunch of Swedes that came in the 1880s had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and yet it's always on our brains, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to get away from it. You do see with the Internet a kind of some, some neo-Confederate debates yeah. that uh, go on. Some of them, I think, because of the libertarian point of view that the Internet has helped give a voice to more of. And, and you know, you do have some people that say, maybe we should have just let them be. Um, they were a state trying to assert their, their own uh, prerogatives, and it's not the point of your book to address it uh, directly. You could take almost either side with some of the research that you provide. 
uh, for one thing that struck me was the amount of venom that was in Charleston and where perhaps the way the North was viewing the South, that it would be a quick and easy war, could have been tested with better research down there. Yeah, you know, I think at some point they just didn't want to listen. I mean, there were a lot of efforts um, by people generally sympathetic to the South, if not, you know, supportive, but at least sympathetic in, in places like England and places like New York. I mean, there were plenty of Southerners who had business, you know, finance or uh, business in, in New York and knew the situation and could take kind of a broader perspective. I mean, one of them, you know, he wrote a letter to uh, the radical secessionists in Charleston saying, look, uh, uh, do you really think this is going to work? I mean, maybe, you know, I should come down there with a delegation of, you know, financial types from New York. We can talk about this. Um, it reached a stage, Bruce, where I think the Charleston radicals had just felt like they had heard enough and weren't going to hear anymore. I think in some sense they lost their faculty of reason, which is what um, one of the few, you know, at least publicly declared unionists in Charleston, uh, James Lewis Pettigrew, felt at the time. I mean, he would write that to his friends in the North that essentially people have gone crazy, bonkers, you know. Nobody talked at the time in, you know, sort of psychotherapeutic Mm -hmm. terms as we talk now, but but it was essentially a loss of reason that becomes, you know, madness. It was called the contagion, you know, it was like a condition or a disease of the mind. And so when you're in that kind of a state, uh, you're not listening anymore. They, they thought they could get a better deal on their own. They thought they'd get a better deal on the world stage. England, France is with us. Yeah. Uh, all of this gave them the cotton is king. Even if we don't, I think you mentioned in the book, even if we don't have the banks from the north, we got cotton, and that's as good as currency. One of the debates that's still present, there's a debate on whether the Civil War was about mm -hmm. slavery, really. keep hearing it brought up, and I think because... It turns some issues that are in today's debates, like states' rights or the power of the federal government. There is some fodder in, in for, for many sides of this question because some comments from the Charleston radicals about bank failures in the North causing all the problems, the, the economic crisis of 1857 and 58, um, tariffs and free trade and, and issues like that. But it also always seems in these debates when someone's saying the Civil War is not about slavery that it seems to always come back to slavery. What's your thought about that? Absolutely, slavery. And, uh, you know, uh, listen to this. Mm -hmm. uh, quote, the issue before the country is the extinction of slavery. That's the front page of the Charleston Mercury on Saturday, November the 3rd, 1860, the final weekend before the vote which Lincoln ended up getting elected. Uh, there was no doubt about that. Slavery. Uh, you know, all of the propaganda that came from planners, I, I profile one of the Charleston planners, John Townsend, who wrote this pamphlet that was about as best-selling as Common Sense was, you know, Tom Paine's pamphlet for the American Revolution, all about, you know, slavery, the white man, uh, cotton, you know, system cannot survive without slavery. So, yes, I think states' rights, is a serious issue. It was, you know, Calhoun in South Carolina was very much about states' rights. He had died by then. Um, but uh, slavery was uh, the way of life, and the entire society of the South was sort of operated around that, that pole. I think people were very aware at the time that what they were defending was slavery and their right to have slaves. So you could couch it in that term, you know, property, the right of property. It's in the Constitution. Well, it was in the Constitution. There was a fugitive slave clause, and it was being violated. So that was a constitutional grievance. But it still came down to slavery. And you'll hear the point that so few of Southern families owned slaves. I read into the book that when you look at the city of Charleston, and a major Southern city it is, that there's so many connections to slavery, even by people who don't own slaves. Absolutely. And the wish to own slaves, one of the promises that was made was in this glorious new Southern Republic, we can bring back the African slave trade, which would mean um, 
you know, more slaves, increasing the supply of slaves brings down their price, right? Basic supply and demand economics. Many planners actually were opposed to that because they already had their money invested in their slaves and didn't want to see their property depreciate in value. But for the, you know, the white collar, I mean, the blue collar guy, maybe he can afford a slave or two. Well, you know, let's make you know, the, the price of a, of a black slave uh, cheaper. So yeah, there was, a, you know, the propagandists were able to uh, appeal to that. And again, as we, as we talked about before, it was important for the blue collar man to feel that he was part of the superior race. That was part of the message. Um, and so that too depended on, on slavery. I found a, a bit amusing in the book, going back to the point about media and its impact on politics, uh, that the Charleston market was all set to go after the presidential nominee. They thought it would be Seward, and then here comes Lincoln. Yeah, I mean Seward was everybody's. That was you know that was the, you know they they don't they shouldn't be picked on there because everyone thought it was going to be Seward. I mean you know the political cognoscenti, right? I mean he was the former governor of New York, state senator Seward. I mean he was a you know a giant. In, in the movement, uh, he was extremely well connected in Republican politics. It all seemed to be lined up for him, but uh, people got a little bit nervous. They went to the convention in Chicago, Republican convention in May. Suddenly, they worried. Well, maybe Seward isn't our guy. He might alienate, you know, votes. As you know, the situation's getting more polarized. We need somebody who's a little bit more moderate. And so somehow, you know, Lincoln, uh, really not that well known in national politics at that time. Uh, becomes the uh, the nominee. I mean, really, one of the great surprises and in, in, in faithful surprises, of course, in, in in history that it turned out to be uh, Lincoln. He was he was the uh, you know the compromise choice, right? He 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 thought that uh, the slave South could be left alone, and eventually slavery would perish. That was not Seward's position. Seward believed in the irrepressible conflict as it was called. And the Mercury, of course, embraced that idea because they also viewed it as an irrepressible conflict. Lincoln did not. I think genuinely he did not. He, he thought slavery should be banned in the territories and the South could be left alone and eventually the institution would, would perish. That, that was his position, basically. And they have to find pictures of him because they don't have them and th then attack his his image and turn him into kind of this abolitionist that he was not. Yes. Unbelievable job there, really. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, how propaganda can work, they essentially invented, uh, reinvented Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, it was, it was fortunate at the time, you know, that men didn't, women didn't travel the way they did earlier. So Lincoln was not known in the South and, and they didn't really campaign either. So he didn't campaign mm -hmm. in the South. Uh, so they had no w way of knowing in Charleston or anywhere in the South really who Lincoln was. So he could be essentially, uh, fashioned as a kind of a demon by uh, the Mercury. They said that Lincoln, you know, he was a coward, you know, which was, of course, uh, not true. Uh, they said that he, you know, he was an abolitionist. Well, you know, the truth is the abolitionists distrusted Lincoln. They distrusted him when he was uh, a member of of Congress. In fact, some of them called him, an, you know, uh, I think it was sort of a, you know, he had a legal case where he earned a fee for helping uh, get a, a fugitive slave returned. I mean, the the, the they called him a slave hound, I mean, the abolitionist. So, you know, Lincoln was a complex figure, as I think we know, but he was reduced, to, you know, to a caricature in the pages of the Mercury, and it worked. I mean, people needed to believe in a foil, you know, which I think is a parallel to today's environment as well. They really needed a foil, and, and Lincoln, this sort of false Lincoln, provided that foil. And I think it's interesting because so you have, there's a couple of things there in that, in that uh, you know, story about the Mercury and Lincoln, you have the attempt by the Republican Party to sort of moderate by choosing Lincoln over Seward, really utterly fails, and you kind of see that no matter who they sent down the pike, the Republicans were going to get this treatment from from the press, at least in, in the Deep yeah. South, sure. and uh, their attempts to moderate didn't work. I, I like that you paint the differences between all the sides on this issue of slavery, you know, absolute uh, abolition, absolute no government interference with slavery anywhere of any kind, those two positions, but also this kind of 
future aspiration for those who didn't have slaves, only had a few that could see that in New Mexico or in um, Nebraska or Kansas that they would have a future um, for themselves that they might not have in Carolina. And then on the other hand, Abraham Lincoln's uh, view, and I had just talked with uh, Sidney Blumenthal about his, his book on Lincoln where he mm-hmm. was talking about how Lincoln goes to Kentucky and sees this practice that he hadn't seen as much of in Illinois and just is horrified and yeah. and his attempt to kind of extinguish it by limiting the growth, not by, right. as you indicate, not by banning it where it exists now. In fact, he might have supported a amendment that would uh, allow it uh, yeah. to, to, you know, forbid this, to forbid any ban in the Deep South. I think he was interested in trying to find a way to mollify, if not appease the South, which, as you, I think you're, you're saying, may have been a fruitless mission on Lincoln's part, but mm-hmm. one that I think he believed in. And look, I mean, the you know the shooting phase of the war started when he, you know, he refused to evacuate Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor, and the Confederates bombarded the fort. I mean, he very much wanted the the first shot to be fired by the South. I think that's a sort of consistent with his dispositions. Seward may not have been so uh, you know, ch- charitable in that sense, right? He might have been more of an incendiary. And there was the potential, I suppose. I think the fear uh, in Charleston was, wow, now the Federals have a have a fort uh, pointed at us in the harbor. And you actually point out in your book how Anderson, um, the, the major um, there, uh, evacuated. It was his decision to evacuate the fort. Well, yes, the Federals uh, occupied, and it was really just a skeleton crew, there was about 70 of them, uh, a fort on Sullivan's Island, not in the middle of the island proper, as Sumter was, called Fort Moultrie. And Moultrie was really basically surrounded uh, in 1860 by, uh, you know, ho- hostile forces, citizens who would come out and essentially bait the soldiers within, and there was a real fear, I think I think a very reasonable fear by Anderson that Fort Moultrie would be attacked and, and, and there would be bloodshed right there. And his appeals to Washington, I mean, Buchanan, James Buchanan was the president at that time. I mean, he really wasn't, he, I guess he was paying attention, but he wasn't doing a whole lot about it. So the situation was really in Anderson's hands. So basically, uh, he decided, you know, on his own, uh, that uh, under cover of darkness, even though it was a moonlit night, he would move his men, uh, oh, I guess it was a mile or two from uh, the position at Fort Moultrie, uh, across the harbor, the middle of the harbor, uh, to Sumter, which was not really some terrific fortress, but at least was in the middle of the harbor and was relatively impregnable, at least compared to Moultrie. So that happens right towards the end of the year, around Christmas time, 1860, enrages the population of Charleston. <laughs> they think that somehow Anderson is, I don't know, setting up to uh, you know, fire, turn his guns on, on the city, which is really far from the truth. Uh, you know, they thought well, he should have sought permission you know, from the city or South Carolina to do this. I don't know why. So then, you know, it became this sediment. Are we going to try to starve the guy out, you know, with his soldiers? And, you know, some of the Charleston gentry thought that that was a little bit uh, unchristian. But nevertheless, uh, that was really the situation that, that Lincoln found when Lincoln took office. Remember, the inauguration at that point was in March, third week of March. So Lincoln is taking office at that time and has very little time to really make up his mind about what he's going to do about this deteriorating situation at, at Sumter. He inherited this mess, essentially. You know, by the time he gets to office, the madness had already ruled in a sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The madness was well underway by the time Mary Abraham Lincoln took office. That's that's that was the situation. What do I do about the you know about Charleston and you know and as we said earlier, Lincoln was a reader of the Charleston Mercury. Lincoln loved to read newspapers, so he knew this. You know, he knew what the state of public opinion was in, in Charleston. In fact. He had a secret, uh, you know, messenger, and in, in, you know, at that fort, Abner Doubleday. Remember him? He's the guy, the legend has it he invented baseball. He was an officer at that at Fort Moultrie, and he was he Abner. You know, he was from upstate New York. He was no friend of slavery or of the the slave South. He was sending coded messages through his brother, Abner's brother, at a bank in New York to Lincoln and Springfield, including maps. So Abraham Lincoln was well informed of the situation in Charleston. One of many interesting insights from the book. 
Madness Rules the Hour by Paul Starobin, Charleston, 1860, and The Mania for War. Paul was my guest today. Paul, thanks very much for appearing on the podcast. Thank you, Bruce. I enjoyed it. Uh, And I love what you're doing with history and how it rubs up against our political present. Thank you. I think we need more texture in our political conversation, not less. I want to thank Paul Starobin. We'll have a link to his book, Madness Rules the Hour, on the website at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Bye for now. Now, if you're a subscriber to the Premium Podcast, it's not goodbye. You'll hear much more. We're going to talk a little bit more about this topic and others on that Premium Podcast. Remember to sign up www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. There's a link there. Thanks for listening.